My name is Lynn Cooper, and uh, on behalf of the Department of Psychological Sciences, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the second lecture in our Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and before I turn the program over, I just have a couple of brief things I'd like to say. Uh, I know many of you were here last week, and I gave a little uh, spiel about the, the focus of the series and our goals and so on. And uh, in deference to those of you who came last week, I'm not going to repeat that this week. Um, but I did just want to say, I, I do want to acknowledge our sponsors again. Um, so participating departments and units, uh, we have management, journalism, political science, philosophy, sociology, the graduate school PhD completion project, Dean O'Brien and the College of Arts and Science, and I wanted to give a special thanks to um, our chair, Dr. Ann Betancourt, and whose uh, support for this series has been uh, very important in our ability to move forward. Um, also, I wanted to acknowledge the donor funds, the Grimshaw Fund, the Fred McKinney Psychology Lectureship, the Melvin H. and Kathleen Marks Experimental Psychology Fund, and the Vaughn Distinguished Visiting Scholar Program. Uh, all of these different entities and units on campus have made uh, substantial contributions to this program, and we're very appreciative for their involvement. Um, finally, I just wanted to say a little bit again about the topic of our series. Um, although the title of this series really directs our attention to sort of a global or international stage, psychology as a discipline tends to focus more on sort of proximal individual causal processes and mechanisms. However, what I'd really like you guys to be thinking about while Dr. Rain is talking to us is a little bit about how these kinds of processes or mechanisms might underpin the dynamics that play out on a larger stage. And then at the end, certainly, let's Let's ask uh, Adrian to comment on, on that relationship, what his work has to say about that. Um, with that, I'd like to turn the mic over to Wendy, Dr. Slutsky, who is a professor of psychology, professor of the, in the Department of Psychological Sciences, uh, and she's going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. So I had to get, I get to stand up right close to Adrian Rain and say hopefully nice things about him. This is a little awkward, but no. <laughs> So it's a real honor and privilege to um, introduce today's distinguished speaker, Professor Adrian Rain from the University of, of Pennsylvania Departments of Criminology, Psychiatry, and Psychology. And those of you who are in from the Department of Psychological Sciences know that he uh, has a YouTube presence now, so you might have seen a little uh, video clip of a talk he gave at University of Pennsylvania. I also learned he also has a Wikipedia presence, so um, someone out there has accumulated some facts about Dr. Rain, so this made writing the introduction for him quite easy. So most of this can be find, found also on Wikipedia, so <laughs> if you want to take a look. so. Um, but I had a chance to have dinner with uh, Dr. Rain last night and um, also drive from the airport and uh, learned about his very interesting life. So the road leading Dr. Rain to the United States and the University of Pennsylvania was a long and winding one. Uh, Dr. Rain worked as an airline accountant with British, Air Air British Airways for two years before receiving his bachelor's and master's degrees in experimental psychology from Oxford University and his DPhil degree in psychology from York University. After receiving his doctoral degree, degree, Dr. Rain spent four years in two high security prisons in England working as a prison psychologist. At dinner last night, Dr. Rain said that there was a time when he thought that he might not ever get out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, Adrian was able to get out of prison and into the classroom and laboratory where he has developed a very impressive and distinguished career in the emerging field uh, that I think is um, a term that he has coined himself. Um, in the emerging field of uh, neurocriminology. So the title of his talk is Neurobiology of Violence, Neuroethical and Neuroleg Neurolegal Implications. And um, his talk will probably last for about an hour and then we'll have about 25 minutes afterwards for questions and um, time for discussion. So um, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Rain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy, for that very kind introduction. Let me say it's a genuine honor and privilege to be here in this series. Uh, this is a beginning of a number of series that you will have. I think these themes are very exciting, interesting. I've heard about next year's theme, which is even more, I think, even more stimulating and interesting. I may even come back and try and listen into some of the talks you'll have next year. 
Um, and it's my, my first visit to Missouri Columbia. It's a wonderful location, very hospitable, history here, a lot of friendliness around here. Thank you very much for inviting me here. What I'd also like to do in turn is invite the people sitting on the stairs to, if you wish, please come down and the seats right in the front here. It must be uncomfortable <laughs> sitting on those stairs. I would not want to put anyone through. You, you, you will not bother me at all by coming down and sitting in the seats here. Hey, well, now, there you go. And, and we'll get on to that point right at the very end of this lecture, actually. <laughs> um, so first apologies. I apologize for wearing a suit. I'm getting a feeling that this is a little bit too formalized, but I was an ex-accountant for British Airways, so you can blame it on my history. And indeed, what I'll do at the end of this talk, talk about blaming things on history when we get down to the neuroethical, neuro-legal neuro implications of what I have to talk about here. So just to uh, give you a brief sense of the structure of this talk, I'll talk about dysfunction to the prefrontal cortex as a risk factor for aggressive, antisocial, and violent behavior. I'll then turn on to a more conceptual issue as with respect to whether we should view recidivistic or repeat criminal behavior as a neurodevelopmental disorder, that the brain is just not developing appropriately in antisocial, psychopathic individuals. I'll then turn on to looking at one specific region of the brain, the amygdala, which is critically important for emotion, emotion regulation, and argue that there are structural impairments in psychopaths in the amygdala. And I'll argue the amygdala is critical for fear conditioning, and that also poor fear conditioning early in life is also a predisposition, risk factor, for later antisocial criminal behavior. OK, well, so far so good, but talking about the societal issues, what are we going to do about it? So I'll then move on to talking about how early environmental enrichment, incorporating both cognitive and social and physical aspects together, can reduce crime in the long run. I'll then turn briefly back to the brain to talk about moral decision making. And I'll try and suggest that the moral circuitry underlying moral decision making is broken in psychopaths. And lastly, I'll go to those difficult questions about, well, what are the implications, therefore, of this new neuroscience knowledge on crime for law and also for ethics? What are the neuroethical and neurolegal implications of what I've got to talk about. And indeed, you will know as much in this area as I do too, and you have as, mu as much to contribute as I. But let me turn first of all to the idea that poor frontal functioning may be a risk factor for antisocial violent behavior. Some of you will be familiar with the case study of Phineas Gage, that railway worker in 1851, who unfortunately had a tamping rod blown through his prefrontal cortex, transforming him from a regulated and well-respected railway worker into a pseudo-psychopathic individual, an individual who was sexually promiscuous, aggressive, gambling, reckless, impulsive, couldn't hold down his job, lost his friends, became very disinhibited, setting up a model for us that perhaps damage or dysfunction to this part of the brain, you'll see the damage inflicted here, could predispose to antisocial psychopathic behavior. That's a case study, of course. Well, how do we test that further? One thing we, we were able to do in California is to brain scan 41 murderers and compare them to 41 controls to see whether this part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, may be functioning more poorly in the murderers. So, in fact, this is not recent research at all. This goes back 15 years. I'll come back to that issue. So 15 years ago, we brain scan these individuals using a technique called positron emission tomography. And we had some of the murderers, they had schizophrenia, so we matched on a one-to-one -one basis in the control group those who were non-aggressive but also had schizophrenia. But many of the normal controls are just normal individuals. The task we used to challenge or activate the part of the brain that we felt was dysfunctional in the murderers was the continuous performance task. A visual task, you have to sustain attention for 32 minutes. Incredibly boring, 
but the frontal cortex is in part involved in vigilance and attention. So, cutting to the chase and going to the key findings from this study, on the left-hand side you'll see uh, an image of a normal control, and on the right-hand side an image from a, a normal one-off murderer. Uh, to orient you, you're looking down on the brain. The warm colors, red and yellow, indicate high glucose metabolism, high brain functioning. The cool colors, blue and green, indicate low brain functioning. And the key point from this study, the key finding, is that normal controls have reasonable activation to the prefrontal cortex. This is the front of the brain, this is the back. Good activation here, and the, the occipital cortex is activated, of course, because it's a visual task. And that part of the brain, <coughs> relatively speaking, is well activated in the single impulsive murderers, but you see a distinct lack of frontal activation there. In terms of understanding that, the frontal part of the brain is critically involved in controlling and regulating behavior, in controlling and regulating aggressive feelings, for example. So all of us feel aggressive at times. About 70 to 75 percent of us have had homicidal thoughts. We've not acted out on them. And what stops you being physically aggressive when you feel aggressive? Well, it's a well-functioning prefrontal cortex that I assume most of you have, which regulates and controls those aggressive feelings. Take off that emergency break on behavior here, and that could well lead to impulsive, dysregulated aggression, including homicide. By the way, I should have a caveat here. A lot of the things I'm talking about are quite general. I know that this is a broad audience. So the reality is far more complex than what I'm trying to illustrate here. Nevertheless, let me illustrate one complexity. Not all murderers are the same. There are apples and oranges amongst murderers. So for example, Here's a normal control. Here's uh, a man who killed one individual. But here's an individual from our series of 41 murderers who was a serial killer. He killed 64 people in a 12-year period uh, just south of Los Angeles without being caught. And indeed, like a lot of serial killers, he was unlucky to be caught. He was just caught for a, a traffic infringement on the freeway you know, in the evening by the California Highway Patrol. And they only became suspicious of, of really anything when they found a dead body in the passenger seat. So, which was a bit of a giveaway, really. But, um, but, but, but this individual was highly regulated, controlled. What you can see there is excellent activation of the prefrontal cortex, unlike the other murderers. But you know, that's the exception that proves the rule. Because, you know, <coughs> You know, you, you've got to have good, something good going f for you if you can kill 64 people without being caught. I bet none of us could do it. He could. What he had good going for him was a well-functioning prefrontal cortex allowing him to plan, regulate, control, cover up his actions. So it's not one size fits all, certainly. Also, there's wide individual differences. Here's another brain scan of an individual who, if you look at that scan, for example, same paradigm, compare it to these three groups and ask yourself, well, where does it fit? You can see, like this serial killer, excellent activation of the thalamus there, the temporal cortex, occipital cortex, and frontal cortex there. So I think if you compare that to these three profiles, I think you probably place it into this profile. What's interesting about this brain scan is that it's my brain scan. <laughs> and the point to make of that is that you're not at all at serious risk for anything happening a bit later this evening, I assure you of that. But the point is that there are ostensibly normal people like myself with abnormal brain scans, and quite conversely, there are abnormal people, violent, criminal, homicidal individuals with perfectly normal neurobiological functioning. Again, there's great heterogeneity. And I think the key point here is that imaging is not diagnostic. It is no way diagnostic. And there are a lot of problems with imaging with respect to aggression and violence. And I'll turn to some of those towards the very end of the talk. Again, just to, show, just to illustrate not all murderers are the same, we divided the murderers into cold-blooded killers, those who planned, regulated, and controlled, rather like the serial killers and those who were much more impulsive and emotional when they completed their homicide. So two groups of murderers, 
And you can see that it's the affective, emotional, impulsive murderers who especially have that poor frontal regulation over their behavior. So again, an important caveat here, you know, we can't just type all forms of violent acts through brain imaging or indeed any other um, a neurobiological measure or technique. There are a lot of limitations on a neurobiological approach to antisocial behavior. This is the reconstruction of the um, location of damage to Phineas Gage by Hannah Damasio, where the tamping rod went through, destroying the prefrontal cortex. And we were interested in getting away from court murderers and looking instead into the community people around us who are perpetrating crime and violence, and look to see, well, are they physically different to the rest of us? Are, are their brains different? That's the basic fundamental question that we were trying to ask. OK, so if you turn away from convicted people to the community, where do you get violent, antisocial, psychopathic people from? We found them in temporary employment agencies in downtown Los Angeles. So people in this experiment were temp agency workers. We recruited them from five agencies. Um, we hired them. So we hired them for three days. And we paid them for the work. The work they did for us is taking part in experiments, brain imaging, diagnostic assessments. So from about a small sample of 85 men, we had 34 controls who were not antisocial. We had 21 with the you know, psychiatric diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. And let me translate that, that jargon into just a life course, lifelong persistent criminal offender. And of course, we know that offenders abuse drugs and alcohol. So we had an alcohol and substance dependent control group who did not fulfill criteria for antisocial personality. We also assessed psychopathy in these individuals using the psychopathy checklist. These are just the scores. This just illustrates, yes, indeed, the antisocial group. This is the target group I'll illustrate. They do have high scores on psychopathy. Now, if you ask these people, well, tell me what crimes have you been doing recently, then 43% say they've been committing rape. 53% have attacked a stranger, causing bruises or bleeding. We ruled out simple assault. 29% had committed armed robbery. 38% had fired a handgun at someone, and 29% had either attempted homicide or they completed homicide. They were not caught for these offenses, but about 50% of this group were caught for some type of lesser offense. So maybe the moral of this story is either don't go to Los Angeles or don't recruit people from temporary employment agencies too easily. And by the way, I, I got that notion of the temp agencies because after being an accountant with British Airways, after I decided, hmm, maybe I should go to university instead, accountancy really is boring, um, I, used to, I used to be a temp myself. And I was really intrigued by my co-workers when we went out in the evening, the sort of stuff I found them getting into. So I always remembered that. And I always took that idea back to LA and thought, how is it really true? And we did find it is really true. Um, but anyway, the, the important point here is that the antisocials, who are the red bar here, on the y-axis, you have volume of gray matter in the prefrontal cortex, ex expressed as a function of whole brain gray matter. They have an 11% reduction in the volume of gray matter, neurons, if you like, in this prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain that was damaged in the case of Phineas Gage. So first and foremost, there are, we believe, physical differences between repeatedly antisocial individuals and the rest of us in society. And they were reduced also compared to the alcohol control group who were not having or manifesting antisocial personality disorder. We also put them through a stressor, um, a stress task in which, well, think of it, you've got two minutes to prepare a speech about your worst faults. We're trying to elicit embarrassment, shame, and guilt. You have two minutes to think about it, Think about your speech in two minutes to give your speech while you're videotaped and assessed by research assistants. Now, in that task, not surprisingly, normal controls show quite healthy heart rate activity, also the alcohol abuse group, but the antisocial group show a cardiovascular and auto electrodermal or autonomic impairment during that task. In other words, they're not as responsive autonomically to those tasks. 
And indeed, you know, if we take these antisocial individuals and break them down into those with low volumes of prefrontal gray or high, the ones with low prefrontal gray, they're the ones with these autonomic deficits. In, without going to, into great detail, this fits a sort of, it's called the somatic marker hypothesis of Antonio Damasio and Antoine Beccaro, who are neurologists, who critically argue that emotion is important for decision making, and that somatic markers like electrodermal responses to stressful stimuli, for example, actually inform decision making. The Damasios had shown that patients with lesions to this underneath part of the prefrontal cortex show bad decision making, they are sociopathic like, and they have reduced skin conductance activity uh, during a gambling task where they're making decisions. So it sort of fits together with neurological research suggesting that the prefrontal cortex is critically important in both emotion regulation but also in informing good decisions. Okay, now, I just highlighted two studies, and, and this is going to be very quick. All I want to say here is that we've looked at all 43 brain imaging studies which have been done so far, looking at brain structure and function in antisocial individuals. And the only important point on this slide is that there's an overall effect size in the direction you expect. That is, that pool together, pooling all of these 1,200 odd subjects together, comparing antisocials and controls, you do find that antisocial aggressive individuals have poorer functioning and structure in the prefrontal cortex. This is far too much detail uh, uh, for, for, for this talk, but it, that, I just want to point out that findings replicate. Not every single study finds this, of course, but an effect size of 0.6 is a medium to large effect size. It's not small. The point is really that these are replicable findings to some degree. Remember, there's no causality from brain imaging studies. All we're doing is showing a correlation, a relationship between poor frontal functioning and antisocial behavior. Causality is a completely different issue, and none of these studies have ever demonstrated causality. And again, I'll return to that point a little bit later. Okay, neurodevelopment. Let me turn to this part. Is the brain developing normally in antisocial individuals? Cesare Lombroso, the father of criminology, he did argue criminals are born bad, that there's a right from the get-go, there is a destiny for crime. Well, I, th I think we know there's no destiny for crime, there's no destiny for really anything in life, almost. So that can't be true, but nevertheless, um, the, what, there is a level in which Ch Lombroso may have been correct at some level in his thinking about a brain biological basis to crime and violence. Now, he was an Italian doctor working in the north of Italy in about 1871, and he was fascinated by criminals. He took every measure he could on criminals. Of course, he didn't have uh, what you, the lovely imaging center that you have here. He couldn't brain scan these individuals. So what did he end up doing? He looked at things like how many creases they have in their palm. And he argued that this is the mark of Cain. This is the ativ ativistic stigmata that marks out a criminal. Yeah, I see some of you looking at your palm. So what, <laughs> why don't we all do it? You take your palm and just curve it in like so. Just bend it, relax it, bend it in slowly. Do you have two palm creases, which is, quotes normal, or do you have the mark of Cain? Do you have just one? Well, Lombroso argued, one, that's the mark of Cain. That's a predisposition to crime and violence. And he talked about more of these things, like having a big gap between the first and second toe. Don't take your shoes off. You can <laughs> check into that later, um, you know, in your own private bedroom. And yeah, it, it sounds totally laughable, totally ludicrous. But bizarrely, it's not. Bizarrely, this is not ludicrous. These are, we now know, minor physical anomalies. These indicators that Lombroso was picking up on, and these are more of these minor physical anomalies. Yeah, check your, your curved fifth finger, for example. By the way, don't worry if you do find one. I've got the furrowed tongue. I'm not really a devil serpent, but I have a furrowed tongue. That's a minor physical anomaly. It's when you have a few of these you've got to worry. <laughs> okay. but, I mean, we know that th these are 
Markers of fetal neural maldevelopment when? At the end of the first trimester of pregnancy. So when you are in utero at around third to the fourth month of gestation, if there's interruption to fetal development, these minor physical anomalies will be the stamp of some interruption to fetal development. And we take these as indirect markers of disruption to not just physical development, but of course brain development, because the brain is rapidly expanding during the second trimester of pregnancy. And multiple studies have indeed shown, going all the way back to Waldrop, have shown that delinquents and criminals, antisocial kids, have more of these minor physical anomalies than control groups. So it raises the notion or idea that could there be something going wrong very early on in life with some criminal, delinquent, antisocial individuals? Perhaps, surely not all of them, but perhaps a significant subgroup of them. I was talking to Steve Hackley just this morning about how we have some very old ideas, venerable paradigms in psychology, um, you know, which then get forgotten about, like, I think, Lombroso's thinking, and then come back into vogue. Well, how do we get at this? with brain imaging. Well, one way you can do it using structural imaging is by looking at something called carvum septum pellucidum. Let me explain that. That's a neurological abnormality which is in place, we know, before the sixth month of life. So if we were to scan your brain, slicing it through the middle here, and we looked in the center of your brain, that's the uh, lateral ventricles here. Dividing the lateral ventricles are two translucent leaflets of white matter. They're actually white and gray matter. They separate the lateral ventricles. That would be an indicator of normal brain development. But some people have carvum septum pellucidum, carvum, cave. There's a gap or cave or space in between those two leaflets, so they are not fused. What happens during normal, normal development is that limbic structures surrounding the septum pellucidum exert pressure on these leaflets and push and fuse them together like so. So you see what you see here, just one thin line. In the temporary employment agency sample that we had, we actually found 14 individuals with carvum septum pellucidum. You see the carvum, the gap between those two leaflets. I mean, you could see this in a scan. You don't need a neuroradiologist, essentially, to see this, although there is a research protocol to define this. So let's take those 14 individuals marked out by carvum septum pellucidum and compare them to the other controls on the measures of antisocial behavior. The carvum septum pellucidum group are the red bars there, and we find significant increases in antisocial personality, psychopathy, significantly more arrests and more convictions. Now, you know, we still don't know what's going on with the brain. We don't know what's causing the, any brain abnormality. This is really, again, a very beginning initial study, very heuristic. But the point I'm intrigued about is the notion that perhaps at some level, you know, repeated criminal offending, psychopathy, serious antisocial behavior may have a very early brain basis, in part. We're not throwing out social factors here. They, of course, are going to be critically important. We've actually always known that. But what we've not known much about are neurodevelopmental abnormalities, which may also, in part, predispose to antisocial and violent behavior. So it's, you know, nothing proven, just a hypothesis, a suggestion to raise. Okay, now let, now let me turn a little bit to one specific brain area, the amygdala, and also the venerable paradigm in psychology that you all know and love, classical conditioning from Pavlov. Okay, well, there is a classical conditioning model of antisocial and criminal behavior, and it starts like this. The premise is that the poor, poorer ability to form associations between events in time, which is essentially what classical conditioning is, the, in the, the poorer ability to link a neutral stimulus with an aversive stimulus, well, if you're poor in classical conditionability, that will result in reduced development of anticipatory fear. You know, that's the fear that you experience when, come on, I mean, we've all thought of doing antisocial criminal acts, 
I mean, I know when I've thought about it, and I thought, you know, I, I could do it. I reckon I could get away with it. You know, but when I think about that, my heart starts to beat a bit more. I get a bit sweaty. What is that? It's anticipatory fear. And it's that anticipatory fear we all have that holds most of us back from committing antisocial aggressive acts. And we are, it's thought that what is a conscience? It's actually a set of conditioned emotional responses all the way back to childhood. So, okay, if we think about stealing something, we feel uncomfortable about it. Why? Because in the past, as young children, we have been punished for stealing. We have been punished for hitting someone. It's like basic, intrinsic, we just feel that's wrong. Now, actually, if you think about some crimes like, you know, tax evasion, there's something artificial about tax evasion. You know, and I think it's because there's no convincing childhood analog of child evasion. You weren't punished for evading your taxes as a young kid. You are punished for stealing and aggression, and those are real crimes to us. And I'm going off topic here, but is that why tax evasion somehow doesn't, seems like some hokey crime, you know? Um, anyhow, this is the model of poor fear conditioning and antisocial behavior, just a model, right? Okay, so how do you assess that in the laboratory? Sweat rate. So you take a, a, you know, two different conditional stimuli. The CS plus is reinforced. In other words, after the presentation of this simple tone, you know, 10 seconds later, it's followed by an aversive stimulus. And I'm going to be talking about three-year-old children, so 90 decibels doesn't sound much to us, but to a three-year-old child, it's aversive. Um, the CS minus is a similar stimulus. It only differs in frequency, but it is not reinforced. So it's not followed by an aversive event. So the difference between these two stimuli get, gets us at conditioning. And I won't go into the first, second, and third interval condition responses, but focus your attention on these. You know, when you develop an association between the CS plus and the aversive event, you develop, you show a skin conductance response, a sweat rate response. You're getting more aroused or emotional. That's our measure of conditioning and conditionability. And we all differ in degree of conditionability. So this is a study by my graduate student. And what we did is we took 200 children uh, starting at age three, and we tested them repeatedly on fear conditioning at ages three. And then a year later, they came back four, five, six, and eight. So Right from age three to eight, they repeatedly assessed on fear conditioning. We're measuring aggression at age eight years. And essentially, this isn't coming over very well on the PowerPoint, but the red line here are kids who are highly aggressive at age eight. On the y-axis, you have degree of conditioning, good conditioning, poor conditioning. These are the different ages of the children. The point I want to make here is that those aggressive children at age eight are showing flat development of fear conditioning, whereas the non-aggressive children show a, a greater development of fear conditioning. So the point here is that, is there some, again, a neurodevelopmental basis in part to aggressive behavior in children? Is it partly predicated on something not developing appropriately in the brain resulting in poor fear conditioning, which then is maybe a predisposition, a risk factor for aggressive antisocial behavior? And you can cut the pie in another way, and you can say, well, let's take good conditioners, the light blue bar, and poor conditioners. That's the biological high-risk design. So you're defining your groups on the basis of the neurobiology, not on the basis of the clinical manifestation. Do it that way, you get the same thing. So in the poor conditioners, the dark blue bars, they are more aggressive at age eight, they are more antisocial at age eight, non-aggressive forms of antisocial behavior. They don't differ on hyperactivity. And that's true. Hyperactive kids do not show fear conditioning deficits. Um, OK, so where is it coming from? What, what's the basis of poor fear conditioning? Most neuroscientists believe that the amygdala, this almond-shaped structure in the brain, is critically important for fear conditioning. So now switching from children to adults, we looked at amygdala structure in psychopathic individuals, compare them to controls. And what you see here is a statistical rendering of, on a voxel by voxel basis, which individual millimeter of the amygdala shows a structural deformation. That's colored in blue. So blue 
on a pixel means the psychopaths are significantly reduced in volume in that specific part of the amygdala. Now if you blow that up a little bit more, here you can see where the structural differences are in psychopaths. So it's especially in the right amygdala more than the left. And there's 13 different nuclei in the amygdala. The amygdala is an extraordinarily complex structure. We tend to blob it all together. But we can break down those 13 nuclei. And essentially, the psychopathic individuals are showing structural deformations to the basolateral nucleus of the amygdala and the lateral nucleus of the amygdala here. What do these two nuclei do? Fear conditioning. Amongst other things, poor fear conditioning. Now, it's a bit more complex than that. I've tried to simplify it a little bit. But the idea here is that in adult psychopaths, they show structural impairments to that part of the brain critical for fear conditioning. In a completely different sample, we show that poor fear conditioning as early as age three is related to aggressive behavior. What we've not done and what needs to be, do to be done is developmental neuroscience research where we measure fear conditioning and aggressive antisocial behavior in children developmentally and see where that leads to and whether there's a convergence of poor fear conditioning and maldevelopment of the amygdala early in life predisposing to antisocial behavior. The only way we've gone a little bit further with this is taking those three-year-old children and following them up to age 23 and finding out 20 years later uh, which children were criminal and antisocial. So in this study here, it's actually over 1,800 were assessed on fear conditioning at age three. In following them up 20 years later, we find that 137 of them had a criminal record. So you go around courts and look for court convictions. This is a case control design. It's a two for one design. For every criminal offender, we have two controls who are not criminal, matched on gender, ethnicity, and social adversity. And what we find there, if you look at their responses at age three to the CS plus and the CS minus, the criminals are the red bars. They're not showing an increase to the CS plus, the reinforced conditional stimulus. The normal controls do. This is conditioning, greater responsivity to the conditional stimuli which are reinforced or followed by an aversive event. So what that's showing is that poor fear conditioning at age three is predisposing to crime at age 23, 20 years later. But as I say, there's an enormous amount more to do. That's just a, a beginning point or perhaps where we may go back to this venerable paradigm in psychology, fear conditioning, try and dovetail it with new neuroimaging techniques on child populations and see where we can get to in having a better understanding of the neurobiology of aggression and violence, far better than what we've been able to do. Okay, so now let's get to the point of, I think, going more to the societal issues of, okay, if there are brain impairments, what are we going to do about that? So it's a difficult question, and I'm going to preface this by saying, of course, there are no easy answers. But let me try at a beginning point to illustrate how there may be potential for change. The beginning point, in a way, was a wonderful study by Richard Neugebauer. And it was the Dutch famine study. If you're not familiar with it, it's World War II. The Germans are pulling out of the Netherlands, and they impose a food blockade on the country. And the starvation in the cities for many months, I think about eight, seven or eight months. During that starvation time, some women were pregnant, either in the first trimester, the second or the third trimester of pregnancy. And some were pregnant after the food blockade was lifted. And so they were never exposed to poor nutrition. What Neugebauer did in this you know, modest sample of 100,000 individuals is followed up all of the offspring and were able to assess antisocial personality disorder using army recruit net records because there was national conscription in the Netherlands and found out that if a mother was exposed to poor nutrition in the first two trimesters of pregnancy, her male offspring was two and a half times more likely to grow up to develop antisocial personality disorder, recidivistic criminal offending. Sets up a model that, gosh, nutrition 
Is nutrition important? We followed up that study um, by looking at postnatal nutrition in three-year-old children. The uh, location of the study is a small tropical island in the Indian Ocean. It's called Mauritius. It's a vol volcanic island. I have to go back there three, four times a year to do research, which <laughs> it's really it's mind-numbing, very boring, and it's, it's terrible. You know, how can I do it? I don't know. But you know, it's for the love of research. Um, anyway, the design here is these 1,800 three-year-old children. Pediatricians assess them at age three for signs of malnutrition. So um, hemoglobin level, taking blood and looking at iron deficiency. Angular stomatitis, uh, I know I had that as a kid. It's cracking of the mouth or lips and it's riboflavin deficiency, vitamin B2. And um, kosher cure is African dialect. It means orange hair. What's that about? Well, all the kids in Mauritius have black hair. But if you have protein malnutrition, you get dispigmentation, a lack of pigmentation in the hair. And instead of black, there's a slight orange tinge to the hair. So that's an outward sign of protein malnutrition. And you know, if you pull out the kid's hair, that's sparse, thin hair. That is also a sign of protein malnutrition. If any of the children had one of those si signs, we allocated them to the malnourished group. And children with no signs were the controls. And we measured them on antisocial behavior at ages 8, 11, and 17. So it's a prospective longitudinal study. So is there a link? And you know, cutting to the quick at ages 8, ages 11, and ages 17, the red bars, the kids with poor nutrition at age 3, had significantly more aggressive hyperactive behavior across the board throughout those ages. That's independent. What you're thinking is, wait a bit, wait a bit. You know, Kids with poor nutrition, they have poor parents. They have uneducated parents. So yes, we controlled for 11 different indicators of social adversity and found that the poor nutrition, antisocial linkage remained after controlling for all of those factors. So it's independent of social risk. What we are thinking is that the poor nutrition leads to um, low IQ, and we found that. So we measured IQ at ages 3 and ages 11, and these are kids with no signs of malnutrition, with one sign, two signs, three signs. You can see the dose-response relationship. The more the signs of malnutrition, the lower the IQ. The verbal IQ, spatial IQ, and full scale, both at age three and age 11. And again, without going into the details, the statistical modeling is this. The poor nutrition results in lower IQ, and the lower IQ results in the increases in antisocial behavior we see at 8, 11, and 17 years. So covary out, equate the groups in IQ, you abolish the malnutrition antisocial relationship. You're showing some mediating effect there of the IQ. Now what we think is going on is IQ is a proxy for brain functioning or neurocognitive functioning. So we believe the poor nutrition is impairing brain functioning in a way that not just lowers IQ and could lead to school failure, for example, and low self-esteem. You know, again, the mechanisms may be social here. You know, the low self-esteem through not doing well at school because you've got low IQ, that could be the reason why you're aggressive in antisocial behavior. Nobody's ruling out social mechanisms here. But it could also be partly neurobiological too, that there's some brain dysfunction which is going on predisposing to antisocial behavior. OK, so okay, how do we change it then? You know, because the model we're giving here is bad brain, bad behavior you know, from the brain imaging research. So again, it's overly simplistic, but maybe if we can improve brains, we can improve behavior, very crudely speaking. So this is a study, a randomized control study, again in the same location, may not generalize to other countries. We gave 100 of the children um, an enrichment which first of all consisted of better nutrition. So between two and two and a half portions of fish um, you know, through the five day week, it would, they would either have fish or chicken or possibly pork with uh, a salad, milk breaks. Um, they also had two and a half hours of more physical exercise every day. Also there was a cognitive enhancement for two years, starting at age three. And the control group had the normal Mauritian experience. You go to dame schools, um, 
It's an ABC curriculum. It's uh, poor, relatively poor nutrition. The kids take usually bread and butter for lunch, for example. They may take some rice for their lunch, maybe with a little bit of meat. That would be the standard diet there. We give a much enhanced diet to the children. Um, we followed up these children at age 11, also age 17 and age 23. I'll come to this data later. But what we did eight years later is that we measured them on very basic measures of brain functioning. The basic measures were EEG, both in a resting state and also in a cognitive stimulation state. Again, it was the continuous performance task used to, to challenge cognitively the children, measuring EEG during that time period. And the skin conductance orienting response, a classic measure of basic information processing. If I play a tone for you over the headphones, you sweat a little bit more because your brain is activated, it's processing the tone. There's activation of the brain centers that activate the electrodermal system. So we can indirectly measure that. And if we look at the kids who were in the enrichment, they are the red bars there. We show higher skin conductance orienting responses. These are neutral tone stimuli, CV consonant vowel stimuli like ba, ka, da, or 90 decibel more aversive stimuli. EEG it's a highly significant finding. It doesn't look it here. You, say, you look at that and you say, well, there's no differences. Well, the standard deviations are small here. There are strong, significant differences. What's happening here, and let, let, me, let me backtrack. EEG can be broken down into different frequency bands. So, you know, delta, theta, alpha, that slow wave activity, that's where you are. For me, I'm beat fast beta. You know, I'm aroused, alert, energetic. My EEG is more like that. What occurring here is that the children in the enrichment are showing less delta and also less theta. It doesn't look it, but it's significantly reduced. What that means is that they have less slow wave activity. Now, as children age, slow wave activity goes down. The brains become more alert and aroused, and more high frequency activity predominates in the EEG. So essentially what's happening is that the children in the enrichment, in this social enrichment, are showing brain maturation, faster brain maturation. And that's either in rest and also during a cognitive challenge task. So actually the point, simple point I really want to make here is that of course we can change brain functioning. Of course, through environmental manipulations, we can change, in theory, the brain basis that I've argued for, for antisocial, violent, and psychopathic behavior. This is, of course, very crude. And the problem is here, we don't really know quite the mechanism of action, because that enrichment was quite complex. But we followed them up also 20 years later to age 23. Those in the enrichment, if we, again, the self-report crime technique, I'm asking you, well, how, how much crime have you committed recently? 23% is the rate of crime in the enriched group, versus 36% in the controls. So it's a reduction in crime of 35%. You know, it's, it's nothing to write home about, but it was a significant reduction in self-report crime 20 years later. You can also look at court records, as I've described, and if you do that, the rates in the controls are about 10%, and it's 3.6% in the enriched group. But it, you know, it's one of those, you know, not quite statistically significant, so not quite there. But mm, pull it together with the self-report data, and well, the journal published it anyway, so uh, you know, blame American Journal of Psychiatry for publishing this. But anyway, it's not a significant reduction, but a reduction in, in crime there. Again, through a two-year enrichment with randomization into the, into the enrichment. And again, I didn't mention, controlling again for 11 indicators of social adversity. What was interesting to us, and this is coming on to the latter part of the talk, is that, remember, we assess the three-year-old kids for signs of nutrition early in life. You can break down the kids into those with poor nutrition at the get-go, before the enrichment, and those with good nutrition. Okay, so in this group, half of the kids, you know, some of the kids have the enrichment, some do not. So the kids with good nutrition, the red bar again, the enriched group, they're not showing much of a reduction in conduct disorder at age 17. That's on the y-axis here. This is not significant. But do the enrichment on kids who at the beginning have poor nutrition, and you see really a strong effect there. The effect size is much higher than it is here. 
a significant moderating effect. This suggests, but of course does not prove, that the active ingredient in the enrichment that is reducing conduct disorder at age 50, 17 is the better nutrition. Now, we can't rule out physical exercise or cognitive stimulation at all. You know, we need, obviously, more studies like this. But it's suggestive, and it's put us onto a track with respect to nutrition. And what I get onto here is that this was an article in Science magazine just about what's occurring in, in research on violence. And what they were arguing is, essentially, that there's no silver bullet that's going to shoot down the crime figures. And that's true. There's no simple solution. There's no magic drug or anything that's going to stop violence. There's no silver bullet. But is there a golden bullet? Is there a golden bullet that can stop crime? Fish oil. <laughs> I feel more at peace already. <laughs> yeah, because war and peace, we are waging war on crime. And the point about this talk, you know, we're looking at the causes of crime. But we want peace, don't we? We want peace. We want to stop violence and crime in society. That will result in peace, the theme of this symposium. And, you know, historically, and again, you know, with Steve this morning, going back historically, you know, when the peasants were revolting in Paris, and Marie Antoinette was saying, well, OK, they're starving, they've got no food. If they have no bread, then let them eat cake. And I think she was partly right. I think she was right that nutrition may be part of the solution to violence. Not necessarily cake, not that, but you know, something a bit better. And it's not just food for thought, it's increasingly becoming food for court. More and more magistrates are intrigued by the idea that there may be something to do with poor nutrition and crime. And could there be a part solution of that through better nutrition? And could it be fish oil? Could it be as simple as fish oil? Now, why on earth would anyone believe that? Why on earth would anyone believe that? OK, I'll show you some data, correlational data, first of all. Now, you can't read this, unfortunately, but let me describe it. On the y-axis, we've got homicide rates plotted in 26 countries throughout the world. This is a slide courtesy of Joe Hibbler. On the x-axis, we have the amount of fish that's eaten in these countries from zero pounds per person to 160. So what you can see there, this is Japan. They eat their whole body weight in fish every year. They've got very low levels of homicide. Turn to East European countries like Bulgaria and Hungary, and they've got really you know, low fish consumption and high homicide. The correlation is actually 0.63, explaining 40% of the variance across countries in homicide. Now, I actually slowed, showed that slide when I was being recruited at the University of Pennsylvania two years ago. And a criminologist said, where's the United States? Where's the United States? They're not on there. So the criminologist at Penn went and found, where are the United States? And they're right there. <laughs> so they sort of ended up believing me. I, that's a true story, by the way. Um, OK, but you could say, come on, correlation is not causation. Absolutely. What you need is a randomized controlled trial where you take prisoners and you give half of them fish oil and half of them a placebo capsule. Well, that's been done by Bernard Gesch, published in 2002, doing exactly that. And placebo, randomized, double-blind controlled trial, it's as good as it gets in randomization and in causality, essentially. A significant reduction in serious violent offending within the prison in these young prisoners there. So the red group, they're active, they have the fish oil, and this is the placebo group. And you know, there's, there's more studies I could show you on randomized controlled trials, which I won't show because of the time limits. Um, and again, yeah, it's a fishy story, isn't it? You know, can it really be possible that fish you know, could actually do something about reducing antisocial aggressive behavior. Let me say, you know, quickly the reasons, well, actually, if you want to know the reasons why, ask me towards the end. I'll talk about how the, how the omega-3 omega contained in fish oil affects the brain in terms of structure and function. But I need to turn very quickly just now to moral decision making in psychopaths. So, the right and wrong, moral decision making, you know, we're all faced with moral dilemmas. So there's been wonderful research um, out uh, from Harvard on moral decision-making, functional imaging research, which many of you may have seen. And this is the key point that we're wondering about. Is the circuitry of moral decision 
making broken in psychopaths. So what happens in normal people when you are faced with a moral dilemma? So you're in the brain scanner and this is the paradigm you'll be given. Okay, so you can read this. This runaway trolley is, is going to kill five railway workers. You're on a footbridge over the tracks and standing next to you is a corpulent gentleman. Now, if you do nothing at all, five men are going to die on the railway track if you do nothing at all. However, you could push off the large gentleman off the bridge. You know, he's a goner, but you save five people. What are you going to do? So think about it. What would you do? Are you going to stand <coughs> idly by and let five men die? Or will you push this man off the footbridge? What would you do? I want to come back to that issue in a second, but I want you to have a sense of the thinking and feeling about that dilemma. So, what happens with normal people during that paradigm? There's a circuit activated in your brain, but including the um, angular gyrus, for example, in the parietal cortex, also the amygdala, also the frontal pole. When we give psychopaths that dilemma, what we find is that they show a significant reduction in activation in the amygdala, not just the amygdala, but the whole neural circuit that's involved in emotional decision making in normal people. This is simply showing a correlation, showing, you know, the higher the score in psychopathy, the lower the functioning of the amygdala. So this is a paper published in Molecular Psychiatry recently. So, you know, that is the question. If, amygdala, if the psychopaths don't have the neural circuitry you know, uh, involved in decision, in moral decision making working, then the question comes to what extent should they be punished? And this is where we turn into the issue of the neuroethics and neural law. What are the ethical implications of where we are going here? And indeed, what are the legal implications of where we're going? And this is the key question, of course, that one poses. That if there are these neurobiological impairments early in life, well, are criminals really responsible for their actions in some way? And Martha Farah puts this in a very nice way. Okay, we're going back to Phineas Gage. And what Martha Farah says is, come on, give him a break for heaven's sake. He had a tamping rod blown through his brain. Sure, he becomes antisocial afterwards. Fine. Okay, but, and you can read the big but that she gives, you know, where do we go from cases like that where there's clear neurological impairment? to the type of cases I've shown you where there's much more subtle neurological impairment. I mean, I mean, in another way, you could say, where in the shifting sands of responsibility are we going to draw the judicious line between justice and responsibility on the one hand and mercy on the other hand, and forgiveness and peace, perhaps, in some way? Let me try and illustrate very quickly the last few minutes a case study where I want to try and polarize this issue in a way to try and be productive, to get us all thinking about both sides of this very difficult neuroethical and neurolegal co coin. What I'll describe here very briefly is, is the rape and murder of Peyton Tuttle. She was a wonderful cheerleader at Charleston College. She, met, she was a wonderful girl by all accounts, um, you know, organizing the adoption of minority children. You see her here. Um, and she left university. She was getting a job with the Cystic Fibro Fibrosis Foundation. It was lunchtime. She'd left her home, went for the interview. She came back to her home to confront somebody who was burglarizing her house. And it was there that she was raped and she was murdered. Um, what I want to do is describe a little bit of what happened want you to hear the words of the mother, because the ultimate issue here is, do we execute this man? Or, if you don't believe in the death penalty, do we punish him harshly for what he did? And I'm trying to polarize you to see both sides of this coin. The side of the coin that this is your sister, this is your, 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 your loved one, this is your wonderful friend, versus having some sense of why people kill, and some sense of perhaps mercy. <coughs> Okay, so what I'll do is just show you um, a brief four-minute uh, docu documentary which will give you the confession tape of this man and show you a little bit of the perspective of, of the, this um, woman's mother and what, how she feels about this.
Skywalker here on the Mile High Morning Show. Beautiful day in Denver. The Denver forecast is calling for a high at about 50 degrees. We're 35 right now. Right now, let's check on the traffic and see how it's looking. In late 1998, 21-year-old Dante Page was sent to live in a rehabilitation center in Denver. A few months later, after a confrontation with the staff, he spent the night on the streets. The next day, he saw a woman leaving her house. Okay, so that's the standpoint at one side, and what the mother couldn't report is all, all the details, which we'll, we'll just give extremely briefly. Um, but she's at the top of the stairs there. She's punched several times in the face. She's warding off the attacker with her hands. He's got the knife, of course, and he's cutting the webbing of her hands. He takes her to the bedroom, ties her hands behind her with a cord, and he's wanting money. At that point, he's just wanting money. That's all he really wants. She tells him it's, it's out in the car. He goes out, it's in the car. She frees herself, and she's running down the stairs again and for the second time confronts um, the perpetrator. He takes her back into the bedroom, tears off her clothes, and he rapes her anally and vaginally. And there's blood everywhere. She's screaming, and it's her screaming that he can't stand by his testimony. He can't bear her screaming. So in order to stop her screaming, he pulls her along on the bed to the corner of a bed and he, as the mother described, slashes her throat to stop her screaming. 
blood gushes. She's a wonderful woman fighting for her life. She's desperate to fight for her life. There's awful cutting and severing of the webbing on her hands. He puts the knife twice into her chest. She's still fighting. She stands up. She's fighting for her life every minute of her life. Two more stab wounds. An eight-inch wound severs the major heart vessels, and the coroner testifies it probably took her about a minute to die. And at one level, you can ponder that and say, come on, you can't let this person off the hook. This is horrific. In the words of the mother, my daughter wasn't killed, she was butchered. That's one side of the coin. Now let's look at the other side of the coin. I was on the defense team defending the perpetrator. I had him brought across state lines from Colorado to California and had him put in the same brain scanner where we scanned the other 41 murderers using exactly the same challenge task that we'd used with the murderers and the normal controls. This is 62 normal controls averaged here. You're looking down on the brain. This is the ventral prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex, the mesial ventral prefrontal cortex. And you can see in the case of the defendant here a distinct lack of activation in exactly that part of the brain that we believe is involved in regulating and controlling behavior. So does he have here, if you like, a neurobiological excuse for his behavior? It's not just that, but I testified that, you know, of course there was a defense team here, not just me. But if you look back at his psychosocial record, in the first two years of his life, he had five admissions to emergency hospital. We know that he was vigorously shaken by his mother as a baby. And what that will do is lacerate the white nerve fibers linking the prefrontal cortex to the more deeper limbic structures that give rise and regulate and control aggressive behavior. He got that because he cried. You know, it's ironic that he slit the woman's throat because she was crying. Um, he was repeatedly physically and sexually abused. He was taken to the hospital at age 10 with rectal bleeding. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out what's happening there. And of course, he's returned home to be repeatedly raped by the neighbor across the road for a number more times. He has scars on his forehead, a six inch scar on his back. It was known that he ate paint debris as a toddler, that's lead, that leads to lead poisoning, that's neurotoxic to the brain. His mother was so horrific that he would elect to sleep in abandoned buildings as a nine, ten-year-old rather than stay at home. He was raised in one of the worst U.S. ghettos. He was enuretic and encropetic until age ten years. So that's bowel and bladder movements, if you're not familiar with those terms. Until age ten years, not five or six. Even at school, at first grade, the teachers knew there was something seriously wrong with this boy, something seriously going wrong. He had eight referrals for treatment at school. He never got one of them. L low physiological arousal is a replicated correlate, well-replicated correlate of aggressive behavior. He's in the bottom 2% on cardiovascular arousal. Poor performance on the Wisconsin card sorting task. Um, look, putting it together, putting it together, a biosocial perspective, biological and social hits, teenage pregnancy, major neglect, major abuse, documented head trauma, complete lack of supervision, the brain scan showing exactly the dysfunction that you might expect will lead to dysregulated aggression, poor executive functions, low physical arousal. What I argued is that this is a walking recipe for homicide. All the boxes are checked. All the boxes are checked. And Given that he didn't ask for any of this, how can you really punish him as severely as you want to do? The jury wouldn't buy it. They found him guilty and convicted him of first-degree deliberate murder. In Colorado, a three-person judge panel decides whether it's the death penalty or not, and they bought the biosocial arguments put forward by the defense team, that he had major risk factors beyond his control, which raises the odds that he would become a violent offender. But can you really accept the arguments I put forward in court? If you accept these type of arguments, is that nothing more than a slippery slope to hell? Because if you buy into that, where goes responsibility? Where goes retribution, the mainstay of our society? Where goes justice? 
come on, there's causes of behavior. All behavior has its causes. Just because you document the causes of behavior doesn't get rid of free will, isn't, shouldn't be bought as an excuse to treat offenders more leniently than they should be. This is the, pay, the, the letter read out in court by the defendant. Look, you know, this is crazy, but I just like to go to park to go fishing and watch birds. That's me. That's who I am. But all you see here is a black man who killed a white woman. And that was really true. And nobody cared until I heard someone. That was true. That was true. We've documented that. And what page says, look, I never had a chance to live. I never had a chance to live. You do. I didn't. Now it's all over. So how do we put these competing sides of the coin together in terms of the need for justice, for responsibility, versus understanding and mercy? That's a question that we could leave to discussion time. This is just summarizing the key points that I've made. I'm sorry, I've gone five minutes, over, seven minutes over my time, so I won't dally any more. But perhaps, do you have questions on either some of the more very general and basic neuroscience points I made earlier, or more the neuroethical or neurolegal implications of where we're going, where should we go on this? Where's the balance between war on violence and punishment and peace and understanding and forgiveness? Any thoughts? Yes. Mm -hmm. It also makes it seem like, oh my God, get this guy out of here. He is, it's a permanent change. It's not going to be fixed. Mm -hmm. It's a physical problem at that point. And I wonder if the, I mean, the, the study with the, the, uh, the people in the prison, right? Yeah. It would seem to indicate that maybe, I mean, yes, early intervention is really important. Yeah. But more demonstration of later intervention mattering would help to make that, it's not so much a matter of mercy versus. Mm -hmm. You're making a very important point, and to recapitulate on that point, because I was asked to recapitulate the questions, you know, well, what about the, we know early intervention is important, um, but we need later interventions too, and isn't that the pivotal issue? I mean, if this was treatable, everything would be different. But could I put to you, you're right, I mean, it would be different, but should it be morally and ethically? Is it this man's fault that we haven't found a treatment yet? You're quite right that when we find a treatment, all bets are off in terms of the death penalty and severe punishment. But here, you know, it's a bit like saying, you know, okay, so um, now we found a treatment for schizophrenia, so now we're going to deal them more leniently. I mean, that has happened. Once upon a time, there was no treatment for schizophrenia, and they were dealt with harshly. Well, aren't we at that stage with offenders right now? Perhaps in the future, there will be something radical. I mean. 150 years time, could there be reparative brain surgery? It sounds, again, crazy, but there's enormous developments in neuroscience. This is an enormous way off. But like the omega-3 study, I mean, to what extent? Well, I think, first of all, that there are potential rehabilitation treatments, but they're still a long way off, and they're still not proven and demonstrated. I think the point I'm trying to make back is, should it matter when it comes to treatment? I know it does matter. Legally makes all the difference, but should it matter morally? Because, because he's, not in control, he's not responsible for the fact that we haven't worked out the treatments yet. Yes? I'm just wondering what your preferred outcome was in this case. Since it seems that you're yeah, suggesting the outcome was not, not the optimal one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This preferred outcome, yeah, good point. Of course we must protect society. Of course we must protect society. But do we place him in a much more benign environment than prisons, which are essentially hellholes? It's the level of punishment. We take away, OK, you know, you know, if you do neurobiological research on violence, you get attacked for all sorts of things, including eugenics, racism, the whole caboodle. The bottom line is right now we are practicing passive eugenics on prisoners. What I mean by that, we don't allow prisoners to reproduce. They can't send their sperm out of the prison. Women can't receive sperm. Now, isn't that eugenics? 
I think it is. So right now, they're not allowed to vote. You know, and I don't know why Democrats don't allow prisoners to vote, because they'll all vote Democrat. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know why they've never passed that law. But, but the issue is the rights, the rights and the freedom and the dignity of prisoners. Now, I know this sounds like an extremely bleeding heart approach here, and I am guilty of that. But a counter to this is I am in favor of the death penalty. And I can explain that paradox a little bit later at another point in time. Um, but, you know, yeah, we protect society. It's the question of the degree and the amount and severity of the punishment that I would rail against in cases like him, in cases like him. But you see, in cases like Wendy, if she did the same thing, which, you know, <laughs> we're putting aside the rape, I say hang a high. I say, hang a high, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, <laughs> pound of flesh. The reason is that Wendy has none of those predispositions you saw in Dawn to Page. She has free will. She can choose evil. I believe there is free will for some people. But I believe that freedom of will is constrained in some individuals beyond their control. And they should be treated differently. Well, an alternative uh, viewpoint would be that, um, there, that there should not be um, morality in legality and that essentially the reason would be that all crime is psychopathic and that we just haven't found the yep. psychopathy yet. We haven't found the causes but they are there and, and that's the counter issue. Should, there's a cause to everything we, we will find the causes but should that excuse people? Because if you begin... Excuse that you've got to keep people as uh, protect society. It's a question of how do we contain and what degree of punishment do we have in prison and the rights and, and, and the freedom that, that prisoners have. Yeah. I'm really curious about um, kind of again getting it to this more uh, global stage. I, I mean, we talked about when we were thinking about this series, it would be really interesting to have somebody here who studies terrorists or terrorism. Yeah. I mean, what's the deal? I mean, what, what did your work say about that? Yep. You know, I mean, are these guys just, you know, are they the predatory type and it's mm -hmm. very calculated and it's sort of more instrumental or is it? Yes. I mean, what's your thought? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's a great question. The question to repeat it, what about terrorists? What, in what model do they fit? First answer, I don't, I really don't know. Um, no not to my, not at the neurobiological level, or not even at the psych, well, there may be some demographic data out there. It's a bit like serial killers. We know very little about them apart from the demographics. But perhaps serial killing might be an approximation of a model for that. Or rather, like as you were alluding to, the planned, the planned regulated and controlled aggression versus the impulsive emotional aggression. That's not going to be a model for terrorism, but it may be a beginning point within which to think about terrorism. And the only other approximation I can give, there's one, two, and three. The other approximation I can give to that is we've studied successful psychopaths. Those who are very psychopathic in the society, but they're not caught, versus psychopaths who are caught and convicted. We talked about this in the imaging center today. The big difference here is that psychopathic people who commit lots of crime and violence as much as the failed caught psychopaths, they differ in lots of ways. They don't have the prefrontal structure impairments. They have executive functions which outperform normal controls, let alone the, the failed psychopaths. And um, they, they show the autonomic stress reactivity that the normal controls show. They have, in Damascus terms, the somatic markers that guide decision making and prevent, um, you know, that allow them to evade detection. So I'm wondering whether that beginning work we've done on the successful psychopaths, again, it's not the same as terrorism, but whether it's a beginning stage to think about terrorism. I know that many of you will have different alternatives, perspectives on terrorism, but does that not partly, it doesn't answer your question. Yeah, no, I'm but. just really, I, I, there probably isn't an answer at this stage of the game, but I was very curious what you thought about it. Right, and I think you were first earlier, and then it was a second and third. Of I was actually intrigued by your uh, comments on the amygdala in terms of what you found that there were neurons that were atrophied so, yeah. uh, as a result of uh, whatever, yeah. uh, including, including the fear conditioning. And you also mentioned about the antisocial behavior in children. Yes. And it seems as if, uh, I haven't read your paper, but looking at the graph, I think what you're 
what I'm trying to show is between ages three to five, they were almost the same, but there was a takeoff yes. after age five to eight yep. that certainly there was a difference mm -hmm. in any social behavior. And I started thinking about, from the standpoint of ophthalmology, yes. that if we were to take a poll in here, probably 2% of the people will have amblyopia or lazy mm -hmm. eye. And in this condition, if we were to put, uh, let's say, a, a, a occluder in front of an eye or, uh, or defocus the eyeglass, let's say, in one eye, hmm. the vision will be reduced in that eye. The brain just shuts it down. And what we could do is look at the nerve cells in terms of the lateral geniculate nucleus, and we'll find that there's a change in the uh, structural changes just from that uh, external environment. And so what I'm thinking is, you're showing a change in young kids at right, earliest age five. Amblyopia, or lazy eye, occurs right around that time also. And we could do something about that in terms of attaching an eye. Uh, could there be something, and you sort of mentioned this, I think, in terms of the early childhood, <coughs> if we were to intervene more and more, because what the amblyopia studies have shown mm -hmm. is that uh, significant environmental changes will affect it, uh, will affect how the brain develops and so could the same thing be happening here and is it now society's role to make sure we go back and do something about the kids rather than waiting until the folks are older and they're committing those serious crimes and then we say well we, we're impotent, we can't do anything about it, we're going to just put you away for life. Throw away the key. Excellent point to reiterate the, the key issue that we talk about amblyopia. We're talking about environmental stimulation critical in rewiring the brain. So where does that lead us to in terms of early environmental manipulations, which can change the brain certainly, we believe can change behavior. I think you're getting to a socio-political question which comes back really to Lynn's point here. I'll give you a personal take as a research scientist and maybe it goes broader than that, I think the best investment society can make in stopping crime and violence is investing in the early years of children. It's, it's a no-brainer. Absolutely, we should be enriching early on the lives because as you say, there are critical periods. That's the critical point. Rather than having to wait and, and have these you know, uh, you know, horrific crimes, I mean, come on. It's never too early to intervene. Okay. But we all know that and we're not doing it, right? Why aren't we doing it? I'm presuming it's because political lifespan is four years. No politician wants to wait 20 years for a result. So is, is it that political dynamics that are holding us back from really doing the important things in society? Um, so, but, but I want to agree with you that I think early intervention is, is, is critically important, yeah. The amygdala, could it be that empathy training in very young children, in these kids with some dysfunction to the amygdala, could bring the amygdala back online in some way? I mean, I'm making this up as I'm going along, but, 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 but are there techniques we can use early on in life which should be more effective than later techniques? Yeah. I have a two-part question. Um, have you proposed legislation to try to write into law this mercy mm -hmm. that you recommend? And, and the second part is, what's going on in courtrooms? Is there, a, a, is there an uptick in the sort of defense that you made in this case? <coughs> Has this been gaining a lot of popularity recently? Are there other high-profile cases that you would point to? Have you, as, Good. The, the first question, a good question. The first question, have I petitioned for legislation? No, I haven't. I'm a lazy academic, and I should be doing more <laughs> like that. Um, the uh, second issue here is, I'm sorry, could you, I'm blocked. Could you? Uh, Oh, what's going on in, in courtrooms? Yeah, so imaging research is being used. Um, it's being increasingly used, but there's a lot of criticisms of it, and rightly so, of imaging research. First of all, it's not causal. It's just a pattern of picture. Also, we never knew what the brain functioning was of the individual prior to the uh, capture and conviction. Everything could change there. A third criticism I would make of the type of ar arguments I made in that court um, are essentially, you can't go from group data to individual data. You know, okay, we show groups of murderers are, all sh are showing this pattern, that this is a risk factor, but we can never go from the group to the individual level. So I think there are 
a lot of significant criticisms of the use of imaging data in court, and people will say it's too persuasive. You show a brain scan of a murderer, and a, you, you show those scans. It's too persuasive to a jury. It's wrong. Although you can show a picture of a mutilated, raped, burnt body in court. And is that persuasive? Yes. So, uh, two sides. And there's more and more discussion um, about, MacArthur Foundation has a network, set up a network, bringing together judges with neuroscientists to try and work out the neuroscience law interface. So the legal system is more and more interested and involved in learning what are this, the limitations of neuroscience in the courtroom and what new things can it tell us in the courtroom. So it's a beginning process with the MacArthur Foundation at the moment. And at the back. Yeah, I guess scientists are a little better because we have a five-year grand cycle. Questions on the amygdala. There's a patient population of people that develop a thousand amygdala and live in the David Avalon of the UC Davis. has done a lot of work with a, a private model of amygdala and amygdala damage. And from what I recall, uh, of these, all that's on my focus, the, the big things that they display are your typical you know, psycho, psychophysical amygdala responses aren't there, but the biggest thing interaction wise is an extremely low social status. I don't recall a lot of uh, psycho, uh, uh, sociopathic behavior activity, not recalling it, but could you, I, I imagine you have looked at that question. And, uh, I mean, has been test out as a model for a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, I, not, not in, in, absolutely, yeah. The, the point, the question being raised here is about the amygdala, about animal research, you know, with amygdalectomies, you know, what really happens with monkeys. So you're right, they don't become psychopaths, certainly. They show very, I think, believe, dysregulated behavior. You're right that they go down in the social hierarchy. The behavior is inappropriate. One of the key findings, I believe, though, is that there's an emotional blunting in those monkeys too. They are more likely to approach fearful stimuli, for example. So you're exactly right. The amygdala is never going to be the one and only structure that's going to be implicated in such a complex construct like psychopathy. And it goes beyond the brain. I mean, so many different brain areas, regions, so many neurotransmitters, 20,000 genes. We haven't started to talk about gene environmental interactions here and about the influences of the family, which are absolutely critical too. So you're quite right, an important caveat. We shouldn't be overly simplistic here in either prefrontal or amygdala or anything else for that matter. And again, it applies to social science research. It's never just one social process. We're just scratching at the brain surface here to try and get some initial clues about what on earth is going on in the brains of psychopaths. Yeah. Oh, yes? Uh, I of your talk mentioned war, and I teach a course where we're interested in military training. One of the problems with military training is that people have inhibitions against punishment. And uh, as far as I can see, the military's attempt to overcome that is essentially tradition. Does any of your, your research be useful? So to reiterate the question, it's, we're talking about war, you know, we all have inhibitions about killing, that's a problem in the army, you know, in the armed forces, you know, um, you say that the army is using some counter conditioning procedures or perhaps some desensitization pr procedures to sort of numb the soldiers, so to speak, uh, you know, and, and sort of, re, you know, rewire them in a way to make them more efficient killing machines. I don't know. I don't know that issue. I'm not familiar with it at all. The only connections I can make to you is, um, you know, the paradox is that, um, you know, in peacetime, we have psychopaths in prison. In wartime, we let them out to get on the front line because we really need them, as you say, because they don't have the inhibitions. One thing I do know from a research standpoint is, as I mentioned, low resting heart rate is a well replicated risk factor for aggressive behavior, at least in children. What is also true is that in the army, bomb disposal experts have low heart rates compared to controls, compared to soldier controls who do not dispose of bombs. And I think you may agree that bomb disposal experts are particularly fearless individuals. So this low heart rate is predisposing to a lack of fear, which is helpful in not taking lives in this case, but saving lives. 
So if you're asking me about you know, how can we have a more efficient war machine, I might suggest you know, imaging screening on that neural circuitry underlying moral decision making, you know, lo looking at resting heart rate and fearlessness in those individuals. It's a bit like a screening process. Now, I'm not saying we should do that. I'm not saying we should do that, but if the army wanted to be more efficient, could they use neurobiological assessment tools? Yes, as well as clinical tools, of course, and as well as behavioral tools. Yeah. I do. Uh, okay, so I guess I'm sort of wondering why you think in the case of this gentleman, he's got certain mental architecture, right, um, that's disposing him in some way by me or by me or whoever else has less of that. Right, because correlations are going to go the other way too. The correlations. Right. I mean, to, to reiterate your question, yes, I am saying that I believe that there are individual differences in degree of freedom of will amongst us. Some of the, us have risk factors that constrain our choices early on in life, um, and others don't. So now, now what's your question going further on that? So, so your question to me is? Which ones don't? So, uh, which people don't have? Well, so... Which, sorry, which parts of the brain are... Ah. Yeah. Yeah. This is, right. So, for example, to, to make it more specific, if I have reduced amygdala functioning, which impairs fear conditioning, and that predisposes me to a more fearless, risk-taking temperament, then as an individual, I'm going to grow up taking more risks and potentially getting some wins and rewards by the risk-taking. And that's the predisposition which may make me, in times of need, more likely to commit a bank robbery than not doing so. If I had an intact amygdala, that when I thought about robbing Bank of America, which I have done, <laughs> thought about, that, it, I would, that it, it's a break. I've got the break on my behavior. So does that make it a bit more specific to you? I, and again, similarly with the the neural circuitry underlying moral decision making. If that's, if, look, okay, when you were faced with that moral dilemma that I gave you, didn't you feel emotional? Didn't you feel uncomfortable, right? Isn't that the engine that drives moral decision making? It's the emotional feel of what's moral that makes us moral. So if we lack the feeling of what's moral, of course we know right from wrong. Psychopaths know right from wrong. But can they behave in a moral way if they don't have the feeling for what's moral? That's the difference that I'm talking about that raises the odds of somebody being more psychopathic, antisocial, criminal, violent. Whereas the rest of us with intact amygdala functioning don't go in that direction. It's not destiny, it's raising the odds. It's probability. Uh, yes, I think so, yeah. Okay, could you distinguish between two different types of potential criminals? Because there are two sort of uh, uh, categories of deficit uh, that I can discern here. So one criminal has an amygdala deficit and doesn't uh, experience enough fear, and so goes out and does something that he could be punished for. Another criminal has fine amygdala function, but has a deficit in the frontal lobes and goes out and does something on an impulse for the reward without inhibiting it. Are those two criminals going to look the same behaviorally, or can you discern how they might differ? I think there will be. The question again is, you know, there's wide individual differences in, in the types of crime committed, and how does this plan out, say, at, at a brain level or a neurobiological level? You're exactly right. And again, criminal offenders are just not one kettle of fish. There's a wide different variety. And frankly, we've never really got down to the level of parsing out subtypes of offenders, like people who commit robbery, people who create burglary. There is, of 
course, work on sex offending. There's been some neurobiological research on those, but we're still a long way off breaking down that heterogeneous construct of crime. Even violence is enormously heterogeneous, and we've never really got there yet. But I, I think we're going to get some answers to why some people gravitate towards some type of offenses by having some understanding of amygdala orbital frontal profiles, for example. Ultimately, I think that would be the case. Thank you.